B- bad person to ask. Go ahead, Tina. You start it off. <laughs> to, in, in what regard? In what? No, no. You keep things. That's huh? the first thing. That's the first. No uh, filter. Said nobody ever about you. You know, like ass- assuming things is a great way to create confidence. Everybody wants to be financially free. Everybody wants it, but you fucking really, truly understand and willing to do what it takes to get there. Welcome to the Behind the Rise podcast hosted by the Perina Brothers. My name is Angelo and I'm joined by my brothers and business partners, Lucho and Valentino. On this show, we will speak to successful local, national, and global entrepreneurs, as well as discuss lessons we've learned in our 15-year career building a nine-figure organization. We're in the middle of our journey now and want to share with you all the wins, losses, and lessons learned behind the rise. All right, everybody. So we have another Q&A episode here of uh, Behind the Rise. I want to remind you that if you get value from this episode, if you enjoyed it, um, if you could please share it with a friend, tell anybody you know, and uh, please uh, rate it on Apple Podcasts if if you like this episode. So let's get right into it. So we're going to get some uh, questions here that came from the peanut gallery. We got Costa in the back, and he's about to ask a question. Let's get it going. All right. Question number one. How do you deal with conflict? Uh, <laughs> b- bad person to ask. Go ahead, Tina. You start it off. <laughs> to, in in what regard? Like in like in internal business conflict or yeah, that's a fucking in business. Yeah. Vague. All right, I got an answer. So you in bull rush it. Yeah. So it goes away. The, yeah, my my number one is just to go directly at it, face first, but. Um, this brings up something I was actually thinking about talking about earlier uh, today is having uh, really direct conversations with people, radical candor. So this is a book that we share with all our managers. Um, I don't know who wrote it. Uh, I listen to it. I don't read. I can't read. For anybody who knows me, I have a third grade reading level. Um, so the book is called Radical Candor. Do you know who wrote it? Kim Scott. Really? Yes. Okay. Kim Scott wrote it. So I believe it's a great book on leadership. And basically the premise of this book is to speak directly with uh, people that work with you or work for you um, in a professional way and nipping things in the bud before they fester into more. Um, you know, we've always struggled with this. I, I struggle with this a lot where I keep things in um, until really? I get, huh? You what? No, no. <laughs> You keep things. That's huh? the first thing. That's the first. You have no uh, filter. Said nobody ever about you. Well, for like a like a couple hours, and then like I'll blow <laughs> up. You know, but like instead of in, you know, like if something's bothering you about the way somebody's performing, instead of like avoiding them, just yeah, being no. pissed off that they're not doing it right, hundred percent, and then eventually, like out of nowhere, you either fire them or yell at them. Right. Immediately, when you recognize it, you you talk with them right. in a direct, uh, you know, in a very very direct way. That's very truthful because I've found that people like that type of conversation. They'd right. rather you not play games. 100%. Yeah, most people don't. Their biggest problem is they don't know where they stand. And I think you, we, we can assume, we've all done this, all three of us, you assume that the other person knows what they're doing wrong. You know, the right. employer, they, but they just don't. You know, like ass- assuming things is a great way to create conflict. You yeah. know, everything yeah. needs to be communicated out and, and, and radically talked about, like you said, open and honest. Yeah. The other key thing is never respond to conflict in the moment. Oh, so like big if one. you're like super yeah, good one. I mean, this is my worst thing. When I get like super jacked up about something and, and I get like really insulted with someone's conflict or anything like that, I just fire a message without like really like settling down. When you're in that moment and so pissed off or like aggravated what's going on, you're so tempted to just fire off a message you'll immediately regret afterwards. So really wait, settle down, whether it's a couple hours or days or whatever it is, get your mind right and then respond rather than responding in the moment. Yep. That's a great one. Yeah. So radical candor. That's the headline. Perfect. All right. Question number two. What is the best way to balance being strict and friendly as a leader? It's a tough one. It's a tough when one. When you're young, that's it's, it's always a tough dance yeah. to, to. You balance. basically you have to draw lines, like right in the beginning, right? If you like you, expectations in the beginning is huge. Yeah, like if you become, my dad used to t- tell us this that if if you if er, if everybody loves you that works for you and the, and they don't f- like fear you at all, then you're not a good boss. 
And when I say fear, not like physically afraid, I'm saying that they want to perform their best when they're with you or they want to act professionally when, when you're around. If you walk by somebody, let's say at the restaurant, right, yeah. and they are on their phone texting and then you walk by and they don't put their phone away, Right. That means that you're not a good leader. Right. They, if they love you too much. They, exactly. Just, that they're too you're, comfortable. You're their friend. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to be, you, you can't be everybody's best friend. You, ha- you have to respect everybody, treat everybody with respect, but there needs to be a clear line where you're not drinking with the staff like after work. You're, yeah. not, you're not crossing the boundaries of, um, of professionalism yeah. and, and keeping that I know, relationship. I never found that to be that hard. I always had a problem with being younger, but I think that was my own like self image thing. Yeah. Like that. You know, telling older people like how they need to handle things. When I feel like sometimes like they have more experience than me, but you know, at, this, at the end of the day, guess what? It's my business. So mm-hmm. it's, if it if it's not the right answer, then I'll fall on the sword for that. Yeah. So I struggle more with that, but I think it's easy to switch hats. Like when it's time to work, it's time to work. When it's yeah. time to be friends, it's time to be friends. Right. I think that the clear thing is in the beginning, in the very beginning of the relationship or the working relationship. Yeah. Is being open and honest, radically transparent, and just drawing where the lines are. And just being, again, over-communicating. I think over-communicating is important. Yeah, I mean, if you just, like, let everybody do whatever they want, like, they're in the moment, they're like, oh, yeah, that's cool or whatever. But right. guess what? If you go out of business or, you know, because your costs were too high or you didn't fix the things that you knew, uh, that you knew needed to be fixed, no one's going to, everyone's going to look back and say, oh, yeah, you're an idiot. Right. Right? Exactly. So you need to do what's best for the business Right. And for and for yourself always, you know, when you're leading a team. Right. And the people that care too, this is another one. I think people will be surprised that that the people that they're worried about, how they will react. Right. Right. So I've had this situation with I don't want to say the name, but it's somebody at Nutre and they had a lot of friendliness within their group of people. But if you again, open and honest, you're straight about what your your expectations are. The people who are going to step up for you, those are the ones that are actually your friend. They, they actually care about you because they know that your job's on the line mm-hmm. and they'll rise to the occasion to support you. Exactly. Versus the ones who have a problem with that, those people are the ones that need to go anyway. You know what I mean? Exactly. They're there just to you know have fun and play games, not, it, not do exactly. the job they right. They just want to play around like that's not, that's not your actual I think it's thing. also important to, to, to explain to the, to the staff that like you're not making the decision for your personal reasons or any hidden agenda. Yeah. Like we work for the business too. Mm-hmm. So decisions that we make is for the business. It's not for me. It's not for you. It's not for Luch. Yeah. It's for the health of the business. Right. Yeah, exactly. So basically clearing, having a clear line of professionalism and always doing what's right for the company, not what's right for you personally. or the people that work for you personally. You always right. have to do, if you're always protecting the business, they might not like it in the moment, but they'll always respect you for it. Right. And that trickles down from the top. Right. 100 percent. Every single problem you have is a leadership problem. That's exactly. what I've learned after all these years. It's like any problem that you have, it, it really comes down to leadership at the end of the day, which tr- trickles down all the way from the top. Correct. Which just always does. Yeah. Another great book, Extreme Ownership. Once you have like accepted that everything that happens to you is yep. a direct result of something you're doing, everything gets a lot clearer and a lot better, you know, and yeah. you start having success quicker. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. Number two. Question number three. How do you prepare an employee for a leadership position? Ooh. Yeah. So that's something that we've dealt with recently. You know, we're dealing with a lot. As, your, as our company's growing, we have found that it's a difficult transition to have people who are just high performers in their position yeah. to go from just being a really good worker at what they did to now managing people. It's a much different skill set. And it's a much different, um, you know, it's a, the, the job description is much different, right? If you're, I mean, if you look at like Nutre, for example, if you're a good person in the assembly room, a good, you, you know, you run the machine well or, or a good cook or whatever, that doesn't mean you're going to naturally be a good leader. And our instinct is always to put the best person, you know, who's really good at their position as, as the leader. So that can, if you have the best person at the position as the leader, that's magic. That's like what you want to happen. Um, but in order to prepare that employee to be a leader, you need to train them on what it means to be a leader, yeah. and you need to start. No, and, show them. Yeah, no, sh- yeah, that's train how them, show them. Yeah. yeah, they're watching the leader in front of them. Yeah, that I think that's what it comes down to. It can't, it, it can't be taught. I think leadership qualities are like are 
either you either people either have them or they don't. And but the other way to lead is by example. Yeah. Too right. Like I don't you, believe you, that you either have it or you don't. I ju- I think that people, you know, you you need to see it. You yeah. need to see it by example. But you can be taught it. You yeah. just never thought to think that way before. That's a good point. You always you, you know you think. Before you're like almost like selfishly doing your job really well. Right. Now you're not responsible just for what you're doing. You're responsible for what everyone else is doing. Right. Some people have it naturally more than others. Yeah. But I think it's a, because you can, you, you know, you can be a loud leader. You can be a quiet leader. Yeah. It, it can, it can be on every personality, right? Everybody's personalities are different, but you know, you're a quiet leader, you know, like you, your, your personality is more quiet and you're a very effective leader. My personality is more loud and abrasive. I wouldn't consider myself a great leader, but, you know, I, I'm a leader of people. Um, we have, you know, people of all different types of personalities that could be a leader. I think it's more you need to show them or teach them or whatever the skills, you know, how to communicate. Like the radical candor conversation, you know, that's very, very difficult for people to, to have. I think that's probably our biggest yeah. problem, most people's biggest problem. Yeah. In transitioning to a leadership role is that especially if when you're when you're at the same level of everyone else then you get elevated to a leader position yeah. because for years right you've been in the same level with everybody you know friendly with everybody now all of a sudden you're being asked to be their boss yeah and that's a very very difficult transition to have so uh teaching or showing or working with the leader to um, help them gain the skills to be able to have those conversations is um is a, is a very difficult thing to do, but that's crucial. Uh, we just had this recently at, at Premier, at Premier Solar, where uh, one of our leaders, you know, that's something that they struggle with is having these very direct conversations. They just want to, they want what's best for everybody around them, but it's like, okay, once you realize that you are serving the people you're, you're, that are working for you, having those conversations is serving them. You're not doing disservice by them. You're not hurting them by having that conversation. Yeah. Once you realize that that conversation is only going to help that person, it it like unlocks something in their brain where they're yeah. like, "Holy shit, this works!" And then the example that happened was they had a difficult conversation with somebody who uh, wasn't performing well. Uh, it was a very good person. The effort was there. This person's been working very very hard, but the performance just wasn't there. It was lacking. So they had a very difficult conversation and said, "Like, listen, you know, you've been at this for so long. You need to change. You know, you need to change this, this, and that." You're, you know, we're basically you're on a, um, not a probationary period, but you need to, you need to start improving your results or else we're going to have to have another conversation in 30 days. And, you know, we, depending on how you've been handling it is going to depend on how things move forward. Next day, that person completely changed. They, they tripled their results the next day. Yeah. And every day since this person is a new person. And it all came from that difficult conversation yeah. that that leader was not used to having. Yeah. I also think having like SOPs and KPIs in place for them to manage as a leader makes it a little bit easier and transparent. So the conversation that you're having is not opinionated. It's not based on fact. Based, yeah. It's based on fact. So if you have those systems in place for your That's leader to track yeah. of the people that they're leading, it's not like those opinionated conversations where it could get, you know, dicey. Right. You're, yeah, not, you're, you're not, not being com- asked to do something because like you decided that. Exactly. It was, no, it it's to- like... It, again, it, it makes things a little more streamlined. It makes things yeah. more black and white and less gray. And for a leader, especially new leaders, you need black and white. Yeah, that's gray. a really good point. So lay out with the people that you're managing and saying, these are the metrics that we're tracking. You need, you know, these are the metrics that we need you to focus on. So then when you, re, you go back in 30 days and look at them, it's not like a, a subjective, like, yeah. I don't think you've been doing good. It's here are, the, here are the facts. Like, this is how many appointments or whatever it is. This is how many yeah. clothes that you had. This is how many things that you did. Then you can sit back, and it's just based on the fact, not about just what I think. Yeah, it's, it's, it's putting a, a system in place for your leaders and your and their team to follow. And it's just like a machine at that point. You know, like, yeah. if one person's not doing this, okay, it's in the KPI, you're not doing that. We have to have a conversation, not because of my objectiveness towards you. It's because of... Clearly, there is an assignment or something that's missing, and let's talk about that. Yeah. So I think it just makes it easier to streamline. Yeah. You know, it's under like going going kind of a little off topic from that, but nothing pisses people off more than when you're being asked to do something that you know that your leader won't do themselves. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like 
do this, do nobody wants to like the the totalitarian, like do this, do this, do this, you know? It builds resentment. Big time. Yeah. So the biggest, biggest like advice I could give to any leader is you need to have in your head all the time that it's all eyes on you all the time. Yeah. All eyes on you all the time. And and the do as I say, not as I do, doesn't work. We, I've been we, trying that for 30 yeah, years. Yeah, we've been trying to get that to happen. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, so every single movement that you're doing is being watched and 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 you might not even realize it's happening. You yeah. Know, but no. like that you have to walk no, around. I like think the biggest you're thing you're on stage all the time. I think yeah. the biggest thing I noticed there is just by dressing. Like for example, if I dress in sweatpants and sweatshirt for literally oh, two weeks God. at the office, oh, oh. two weeks later, exactly. everyone wears that. Right. If I in the beginning I bring my dog to the office, right? Everybody I bring my dog to the office, you know, because because my personal reasons or whatever, but all of a sudden, a week later, like two dogs showed up at the office. Do you remember that? Yeah, oh yeah, I, t- I remember. I was pissed. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we we were we saying told you that's exactly what's going to happen. We told you, know, if you bring your dog, <laughs> again, everyone's going to bring their but dog. Then, you know, yeah. I had to literally had a sit down conversation with them and be like, "Listen, Romeo's here for X, Y, and Z because of my reasons. So like, we can't. You know, I had to have that conversation. But it's crazy how that happened yes. that way. Yeah, I'll give you another example of that. We had a situation a few years ago where in the summertime it's hot as hell in a kitchen, right? And the chef asked, he's like, can I wear shorts, right? And we were like, no, you can't. And he, because, uh, you know, because everyone else is going to start wearing shorts and it's like a, a danger. Like you can't wear shorts That's in the like kitchen. A sanitation. It's, a, it's a sanitation thing and it's, a, and it's a safety thing, right? So after our going back and forth, I finally said, all right, you can, you know, because he was like really pushing. I said, do it. But if other people start doing it, he's like, he's like no, no one's going to do it. It's just me. I said, okay. If everyone starts doing it, then I'm going to have to put an end to it, right? So he he wears them. Within not e- the next day, every single person came <laughs> in with shorts on. Without ev- no one ever actually talked about it. Yeah, everyone just came in with shorts on. It. So we had to make a point, you know, no shorts. And then even when we go into the kitchen, just coming in and out, I don't wear shorts yeah. for that reason. And he, he so this too is tardiness too. Like if the leader is there at nine a.m. Yeah. Then everyone else will be there by yeah, nine a.m. That, that goes if the leader starts to show up late, yeah, nine fifteen, nine twenty, whatever, yeah. everyone sh- it's yeah. the, everyone it's like ants. Yeah. Highest lesson number two, hold the standard. That's yeah. how you you maintain being a good leader. Your standard sets the standard for everything else. Your shorts sets the standards for for everyone else's shorts, right? Right. So if you're if you're going to be a couple minutes late, it's okay to be a couple minutes late, and that trickles into every single yeah. other thing you do. That's why I'm like upset with meetings. And like other people having meetings, I literally tr- go there to make sure that everyone's meetings are starting on time. Yeah. Because if your meeting starts late, then you don't give a shit about anything. That's that's just the perception that everybody sees. It's a sees. telling sign. It's like, oh, they, you know, they don't really care too much about this meeting. Now, that means that servers can come in late. That means that this guy can be late. That means that nothing really matters, you know? So timeliness, punctuality, but keeping the standard high and not ever letting it go down. And you may think, and I think, you know, this trickles into my, I have so many different things going on that, like, I have, right. I should have, like, leeway to, to, uh, yeah, to, that's a, to exactly. take off the standard a little bit. But it doesn't matter. But it doesn't work, and yeah. it does not work. Like, you, being a leader, the, when people say it's, like, lonely at the top or whatever, it's a very difficult job to be, to be the leader. Yeah. It's a ton of responsibility. And like you said, if you know, all eyes are on you, there's a spotlight on you all the time. So mm-hmm. if you're in a bad mood, if you're, you know, like, you know, cussing other people yeah. out, even if it's got nothing to do with this, you're on the phone, like yeah. somewhere else, people are watching how you interact. Yeah. With that other happens people. to me all the time. Like, because of exactly what you just said, like we have three restaurants, we have all kinds of shit going on. Like I can be in 10 different places in like a three hour period. Right. Yeah. So in my mind, I'm like walking in and out of like restaurants or whatever. I might not say hi to every single person. Yeah. But I find out that day later, Oh, like Lucho came in and didn't say hi to anybody. Like what's, what's wrong with him? Or right. What's his problem? Or he comes in like, you know, he's got like a long face. It's, it's like, dude, no, I just literally, I, I can't say hi to every single person every single time I walk in. But now that's like something that's in the front of my mind. Any person I see, it's eye contact, hi, great to see you, like smile, trying exactly. to keep the energy up because, you know, floating around like the phantom doesn't work. Even yeah, though yeah. I have an excuse in my own head that Exactly. That You're walking okay. in thinking about something else, not even saying, right. go and right to the espresso it's machine. It's like, yeah, p- people should know that. You know, it's like people should know that. They know that, I'm, but they don't. You exactly. Know? Everyone has their own world that they live in. Exactly. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. That was a good one. That was a long one. Question number four. What is the number one quality you look for in employees? Go ahead. Depends on what role, but if I were to generalize it, it's just general, like, grittiness. Like, just grit and want. And you could typically tell when you're talking to someone on a first interview 
how their manner is, how their voice sounds, their just attitude in general, if they have greediness to like wants to do something, like to want it. So in sales, a lot, like you can really start, when you have conversations, you can hear it in their voice, you can hear in their demeanor, if they actually really want it or not, or if they just want it, but they don't want to do the work for it. If they're the willing. That's hard to, that's hard to determine. I, 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 I can't tell I you can, how many people I've interviewed and met and you ask them like what they want. They tell you what their goal is, right? Then they'll say they'll do anything that whatever is necessary to get their to hit that number, to hit that goal. Then the minute it's like five o'clock or yeah. things get tough or, you know, they're, they're, they're out the door. It's I've, that is true what you're saying, but I've had a very difficult time uh, identifying that in people. It's hard because people say it because everybody wants to be financially free. Everybody wants right. a good life. Everybody wants it. But do you fucking really, truly understand and willing to do what it takes to get there? Well, That's, it really depends on the role, too. No, it does. I mean, yeah. it's, Like if you're hiring for sales, it's a whole lot different than if you're hiring a cook, for example, or if you're hiring you know, a dietitian or something. Service. Yeah, customer service. It's... There's different things. But. Yeah. So, I mean, it, de- it depends on the role. Um, you know, for like blue collar, like, you know, uh, positions, I look for people with longevity in, in other, you know, that they've worked at other places for a long time. Uh, people who are, we look for character, good people. Yeah. Are you a family person? Are you somebody who likes to party, you know, on the weekends? Right. That's the common denominator for any position, right? Yeah. Like yeah principal. We, we look for character in people. Yeah. I say it all the time when it comes to people at the restaurant is that the skill we can teach you, character we can't, right? So we look for, you know, we have a, we're very lucky in the, in, in the restaurant business because I hear about other restaurants where the cooks are showing up drunk or they're leaving, yeah. they, they don't show up. I don't think we've had anybody no. that's with us who's been with us for any kind of period of time. That's a leadership thing. Though, no show. That's what we attract. Right. Like that they don't no show. Yeah. Like so we have I can say confidently that if you come in to work at one of our restaurants, it's yeah. all good people that work there. For sure. No scumbags. There's very little drama. Or if there is drama, we cut that out immediately. Um uh, but there's very, very little drama. It's really just a matter of you know, our biggest issue is that everybody wants to work so much. Like, yeah. you, we got to control, you yeah. know, there's such hard workers and everything. But we're looking for character when it comes to that, you know. Yeah. yeah. Outside of that common, like, baseline of character and, like, integrity, then it's then it's being really specific to what you need for that position. Because I've gotten really confused at times, too, mm-hmm. where it's like I'm hiring somebody I like, but it's like, wait a minute, what, what am I hiring for specifically? You know, like, if you're looking at somebody specific for sales... There's this completely different set of personality traits that you're really looking for. Yeah. Right. If you're looking for a customer service person, they you know they really need to be they need to love people. You right. Know, you can't just be somebody that you want to hang out with on the weekends. Right. You know, like you can't forget about the position you're hiring, and it's like you got to keep that really front of mind. Like, what is the most important thing for this role? Yeah, and that's that leads me to another point. If you're hiring for a high level role, right? Someone who you know, in a, in a high level position, like, um, who, you know, is like an executive level position, do not hire based on, you know, what, if the person doesn't have the right experience, do not hire based on just, you think that you can make the person what you want them to be Hire based on if, if they've done it before for somebody else in a proven way, Mm -hmm. when you're talking about a high level position, right? Because when you're dealing with the high level positions, you want to learn from those people. They, right. You want to hire people who are smarter than you, who are better than you. Right. Um, we've had the problem in the past and not so much recently where we've always, like, I don't know if it was by design, if our ego is doing it subconsciously, but we're always, like, the smartest people in the room, like, telling everybody what to do. Now we're at the almost at the point where, like, we're walking in and, like, asking them, like, all right, what are we doing next? Like, right. what's the next move here? And it's because we're hiring people now that have experience, who have done it before, and who are going to lead and actually bring something to the table and pull the company forward. Right. Not everything relies on us to pull forward. Right. Okay. Like we need to set the vision for the companies, but the people in the high level uh, positions are the ones doing it or, or the ones who are practically putting everything into I play. Think, I think we pulled as much as we could on ourselves at this point. 100%. I think oh, yeah, at that's this point, fact, yeah. we like push and pull like with fingernails, fucking like. Dragging through mud, thin, Brute whatever. Strength, yeah, yeah. it's just like hard but work. But at and this point, like where we're at now, it's like all right. Yeah, exactly. It's time to you know we need to we need some higher level, 
you know, people who are just smarter than us, you know. And we, we made a good hire with a, a new tray that is very clear. And when you talk to someone who's smarter than you, you're like, whoa, okay. Yeah, I remember mm-hmm. you said to me, like, when I'm on the on calls with him, like with you and other people who are on our teams, he you literally said, it's like, I don't even have anything to say. Like, I'm over there just, like, taking notes and, like, I'm learning. Really, I'm like, yeah, okay, I'm really that's... learning from him. That's how you know it was a great hire. Yeah, yeah. That's when a, you that's are the person right on, the, on the call who's, like, like don't know what the fuck's not don't know what's going on but like you know like learning I have nothing from it to contribute the conversation i'm having i'm there's nothing i can contribute that he's not already talking about at a higher and more accurate level than yeah. i am yeah, yeah that's called a great hire yeah that's a great hire yeah i don't think it's necessarily being smarter either it's like that person just more has experience. experience yeah he yeah. has more experience and knowledge in knowledge one, one specific yeah. a particular area exactly right? exactly in the As, area yeah. that we hired that we hired him for it's he has just so much experience yeah. that it trumps any gut business experience I have by like 10 miles in this specific uh, right. And that kind of opened our eyes to like Whoa. high level positions everywhere. Yeah. So now we started uh, applying that all over the place. Exactly. And then that's, that's an unlock. Like yeah. that's something that. Big time. But like I do think that, that every entrepreneur though needs to. You need to be a little bit of a marketer. You need to be a little bit of an operator. Yeah, first, for sure. You need to be a fucking uh, an attorney at times. You need to be a little bit of, of everything until you get to the point where you're not the best person for the job anymore. Right. You know, once you're not the best person to be the operations director, you got to hire another one. Mm-hmm. It goes back to what's best for your business. If I'm it, like, yeah. I literally look at Nutre and I'm like, this guy is yeah. just so much better than me. That's literally exactly what happened role. there. Yeah, that's Nutre happened to me deserves a million, million different times. If Nutre deserves him more than I, yeah, right, in this current state, yeah, right, that's what you're. That's what you when you talk about like you have to put your ego aside. It's ex- it's exactly that. Right, exactly. If Tino was blinded by his own ego, he would. You know, he thinks he's the best marketer in the world. Exactly. Even though you're talking to the kid who, you know, who's li- actually is like one of the best in the world. You know. Exactly. And it's like okay, you know, I'm only hurting the company if if I let my ego stay in exactly. front of this. Yeah. Yeah, and that's and we find that even in the kitchens. Like I always feel like I need to be like the one who knows everything in the kitchens, yeah. right? But now we're you know, we're hiring, you know, chefs and people that it's like, oh wow, they they set that thing up a hundred percent, you know? And, yeah, they did a, ten, just, a better job than in, you did. If I get in there, I'm just gonna fuck everything up. You know? Yeah, you're gonna do Luke, it your way. You have a couple of good tips for like interviews, interviewing people to find because sometimes when you interview someone, like when you go to go back to the question, you don't get the real person. They put like this mask up of yeah. like yeah. they watch a couple of YouTube videos of like how they should interview and how to answer questions. When you say like, you know, what's the be your best trait and worst trait, and they like answer so robotically, like to get that mask off and to talk yeah. to them. Yeah. To say, listen, we're just having a conversation. You're setting the expectation. Hey, we're having an interview, but it's just us having a conversation. You ask me questions, I ask you questions. I'm just trying to get to know you, kind of break that barrier down, yeah. and then you start to really hear. Right. Who and what? Yeah, I, yeah. The, the the general rule of thumb is the better the interview, the worse the worse the person is going to be. <laughs> yeah. That's a general. Well, rule. yeah. Well, like when you have the people that are professional, uh, you know, they're scripted responses. Exactly. Right? That's how you know yeah, that, like per- that person has practiced a lot yeah, on interviews. They've done way too many interviews. Exactly. If you're that good at interviewing, it's a problem. Exactly. You know. So again, it depends on the position. You yeah. know, it depends. You know, if if it's a high level like management position, you yeah. don't want people who have been jumping around a yeah. lot. No, but we're we're good at interviewing because of that reason. We make people feel comfortable immediately. You know what's funny? Like as soon as I swear in the interview, yeah, quick dick joke right all, off the bat. Yeah, all mm-hmm. of a sudden, like yeah. okay, this kid. So you yeah. start to find out who they really are. Exactly. Yeah. Not who you know who they are behind the mask. You know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good tip. All right. Next. That was all the questions you had, but you can have a bonus question. You have your own personal question, Costa? No, Let it fly. No, it's not my own personal question. <laughs> I can I, I could ask some personal questions, but I'll stick to the uh, bonus ones I have. Uh, I think both of you guys are part of masterminds. I don't know, Tino, if you've been part of a mastermind, but is it worth joining a mastermind? And if so, what are the benefits? Oh, definitely. Every mastermind that I have um, joined, I've, I've gotten a lot from. To I've, me, to me, noticing it from the outside, the sooner you do it, if you can afford it, the better. The sooner you can get into it, and you find the right guy and you identify the right one, the better. Like if he went at five years ago, we would be five years ahead of what we're doing now. If Lucho did it when he was twenty-two, everything would be a lot different. If I did it when I was eighteen, 
Yeah. You know, everyone would be a lot different. <clears throat> right. It's you're investing. It's an, it's an investment into your personal development. And I, again, it could be an ego thing. You're thinking, I think I, I know everything already. What are these people going to sh- tell me about right. the industry that I know everything about? Um, but you realize very, very quickly, if you're in the right group, yeah. Um, again, not every mastermind is built the same. Right. But the ones that I'm in, um, I feel like I get a ton of benefit on. I mean, I'm I'm in one that Lucho's in uh, called it's called the Matrix, right? Yep. And that one is more about so far. I've only been in it for a few weeks. It's more about unlocking uh, your ability to like visualize and in the the format. You know, um, you know, there is more. Um, like entrepreneurs come on or you don't necessarily need to be an entrepreneur, but you come on and you're able to, you know, you have like the floor, you can speak about any things that are going on. And then everyone else in the group, including the person who's running the group is offering you unbiased, you know, like a 30,000 square, I mean, a 30,000 uh, foot view of your situation. It gives you like unbiased opinions. Um, that's just one of the benefits of the group. In addition to like the network and all the people that you meet in there, this other group I'm in um, with Eric Spofford, uh, called Inner Circle is really, um, really tactical business advice, like really, really tactical um, work that you get to do with Eric directly. And I don't know how he does it because there's so many people in the group, but he really makes you feel like you have one-on-one attention with them. And uh, with that one, again, the, the network of, you know, you're around all like-minded people, everybody who wants to see each other win, um, that is very, very powerful in itself. But if you can get into a group that's going to give you really tactical advice on business because all business is the same you know when i went to the when i went to the group there was you know people who were part of sales organizations there's one guy who owned a food distri- distribution company um their insurance sales people i mean there was all walks of life at, at this group but the principles were all the same leadership is the same how to scale is the same um how to handle you know different things with taxes and real estate and all that stuff is all the same you know so if you can get to with people who have done it before and who have done exactly what you want to do, I would look for a mastermind group that um, has somebody or the person who runs it is someone who's actually done it before. You don't want someone who that's all they do is coach and they don't have any other type of business, I don't think. It's yeah. like a teacher, dude, when you're in college and there's a professor trying to teach you business and he has no business experience. You're like, what the fuck do I know from you, dude? You just learned it from a book. Yeah, yeah. you fucking, you know, you have no experience, but... If you could find someone, if you're if you're in solar company and you want to learn from the best solar person, you find a mastermind in the best solar person. Yeah, so that's yeah. another that's a third one that we're you know we're in solar CEOs. You know that's uh, they're um, people who run a massive solar company that are teaching you very tactical information on what they're seeing in the industry at a very quick at a very quick pace. So instead of you learning and fumbling over yourself and figuring it out as you go, you're you're in this group of people that. Um, you're able to talk to like all these owners throughout the comp- uh, throughout the country. Like, hey, what are you doing with this? How are you handling that situation? And everyone's just there to help each other. It's it's a a beautiful thing when you know when uh, when you're able to just get unbiased advice from other people who want to see you do well. You know, and it's, yeah. they're doing the same thing you're doing. I think eventually we're going to get to a point where our purpose will start to be shifted towards us having our own mastermind in our own little way. Um, yeah, that's something on my long term like vision board is that that's something I can see our, us doing long term. That's part of why I love doing this, uh, love doing the podcast is because we get to learn from other business people, you know, when we do interviews and then we get to, you know, do something like this where we're able to give a little bit of advice based on what we know, you know, and helping hopefully help other people who are watching. Yeah. And if you guys get any uh, t- like if you like anything or don't like anything about the show, message us on Instagram and let us know just as like a side tip. Um, those feedback, like when someone messages me, like, oh, I love the show or, you know, this, this clip was great. It's like, oh, cool. And it kind of gives us more ideas on what we can do and, and better it. So just to, I guess, yeah, an off topic tip. Yeah. Yeah. Or if you don't like something, that's fine too. You know, like, let, you know, let us know. Cause we need to know how to. Yeah. Like Angel talks too much. He's a, he's a piece of shit. You know, like, let's. <laughs> yeah. I realize I stutter and say, I'm a lot. Yeah. Ridiculous. Yeah. And I guy. talk too much. Depends Apparently. if you're on carbs or not. Yeah. Angel, yeah. had, Angel had two slices of pizza last night and lost absolute control this morning. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm hungover. Like whether I, it feels like I drank like 30 beers last night and uh, I ate two slices of pizza, not 30 Little beers. Two slices of pizza, but four and a fire. Yeah, they were. The pizza was good. I will say it. I don't know what you were talking about with the dough? You were what? like, oh, the dough. No, the because dough the dough, the dough was is good, but it didn't rise. Uh, it was too cold. The dough. 
It was that was the whole point. It was too cold. So when it's too cold, it doesn't. That type of dough needs time to proof properly, and it was too cold. That's why it was too thin. It should be, you know, fluffy or crispy on the outside, fluffy on the in the inside. I had a dream that our chicken parm had more sauce last night. Oh my god! I can't okay. get over. Tino's it. obsessed with Jesus. Uh, the I'm stuck parm. on. We are it, gonna dude. put another ounce or two I, of we sauce. might have to if that's what it takes yeah if, whatever it's going to take to make you stop saying more sauce Literally, on it we'll i'm do. just so sure on it i'm so sure yo yeah that's... comment below if you think we need more sauce on our chicken parm at four now only at four now at four now now the one at peabody's fire because it because has there's enough sauce all right <laughs> fair enough thank you all right that's the end is that it are we done we're talking about chicken parms now i think yeah, we're done definitely done okay all right that's a wrap see you next week <laughs> yeah.